So, hello everybody, I'm Olga Ioannou, I'm a PhD student at the National Technical University of Athens. And this is my professor, Ms. Nelly Marda. She's I'm an associate professor at the National Technical University. And what we're talking about is that we understand the situation completely. Because our students react like that, usually they don't come to the open lectures. Because, and if they are published in the web, we prefer to look at them from the web. So it's a sign of our time. And that's what, uh, that's about we're going to talk online, online education anyway. Because they think that the future is there. So I was giving an example. We're running a project in Nicosia this year with the final semester, which is in Cyprus. And we didn't have money to get them there. Yeah? So we created a blog. We collected all the materials, maps, everything. And we said, you can get in. And they didn't mind not going. Nobody protested, nothing. I was expecting the whole year to come, hey, hey, why don't we go to Cyprus? We need to visit, we need to see the place, we need to experience nothing. So we asked them, why don't you protest? Why don't you want to go to Cyprus? And they said, you know, we don't mind, because this is our life from now onwards. This is the international, international competitions, we never go. So we are used to collect the materials from the, from the internet. And that was shocking, of course, but that's what they are. So we have to accept that. I mean, this is my uh, reasoning with the youths. So I have accepted that. And that's what I was telling our colleagues, that uh, it's similar everywhere. They, they know how to use the web, and they work through the web. Mm -hmm. That's it. So OK, today we're going to talk to you about a course we've created at the postgraduate program of uh, National Technical University. Uh, we try to combine uh, online education and in-class presence on one hand, and on the other, we wanted to experiment on the nature of the design studio and the methodology class. So we created a hybrid course in both senses, uh, online and in-class presence, and a theory and design course together. So uh, what I'm going to show you is how uh, we reflected upon this to make it happen. So uh, this is my PhD research title. I'm looking, I'm investigating the subject learner in this new environment uh, of education. And these are the two ways I've started, you know, investigating. One is the design studio and how it works for the architectural programs on one hand. And the other is uh, digital online tools of learning, which is a current um, trend you now in architectural education. Uh, first thing uh, um, defines, determines the format, the layout of the course. The second, the way the course is conducted. So, I'm going to talk to you about online education for a bit. I don't know if you are aware of what's going on in the uh, last five or six years. So, there have been uh, experiments for online education through MIT. Uh, I'm sure you all know OpenCourseWare. You're nodding, so you know it. Uh, but it, they were limited, they were um, consumed by the students of the, the institution, and they were uh, done all in a very close circle. That changed with Khan Academy. I don't know if you know Khan Academy, it's a mathematician who used to uh, tape all these videos of uh, you know, uh, resolving exercises, mathematical exercises, to send to his nephew through YouTube. But suddenly people <coughs> became aware of that. Uh, series of videos and started uh, attending the videos, mathematicians who wanted to see how these exercises were resolved. And Khan Academy uh, received uh, funding for $2 million and suddenly it became a, a major trend, uh, an online trend, where everybody attended to, uh, to see how it, uh, the mathematics were done. And now it's, it's an academy because it hosts uh, classes of physics, uh, chemistry, so on and so forth. But it's for uh, uh, younger pupils, no? No, not students, youngsters. And then we have MOOCs. MOOCs were uh, created in 2008. Do you know uh, what MOOCs stand for? stands for? Massive Open Online Courses. This is a map of how things were created in the last years. You have 
the MIT course, open courseware. And then you have a major breakthrough in 2008. I'm going to talk to you about this major breakthrough. And then suddenly this became a trend and now we have a series of major providers for online education worldwide. This is the major breakthrough. These two gentlemen are responsible for the major breakthrough in 2008. Uh, George Simmons and Stephen Downs uh, are professors at the Athabasca University in Canada, Manitoba, and they had 25 students, but they decided to work on a new type of course where uh, they would uh, open it up to uh, more people, to a major public, uh, they would grade the 25 students, but these 25 students would interact with the rest of the world, depending on how many people inscri were inscribed in the course. And they got a 2,500 uh, proud, unexpected number of people uh, attending the course online. But this course was very important because it was not controlled centrally. I mean, they... Uh, so, uh, they transmitted a content, right, the course content, but they did not try to control what, would, what was happening after that. They asked the students to establish their own blogs, right, and to interact with each other in this whole new network of attendees, subjects, learners, uh, on, on the net, on the web. It was amazing because these people did not learn from the master, from one instructor. The course content was not limited to uh, one man's content, but it was open to 2,500 people and their own views about the matter. <coughs> this happened in 2008. Uh, up until 2011, there was a, uh, no, what, how, how do you say, zimosis? Um, uh, people started wondering about this new trend and what they could do with it. So the major institutions, Stanford, Princeton, Harvard, all of these universities started thinking, reflecting upon this new tool. How can we use it? So you know in the US there is this major problem with the student loans because it costs too much, too many. So they thought that they could transfer some of the, course, uh, the courses online so they could relieve the students from some of the financial weight, the financial burden of studying in these institutions. So they've created another type of book, which we're going to see as we go along. The X book, which is the traditional format of the lecture, only transmitted online. So they took what the first two gentlemen did and they formatted, they developed it into a new product, uh, educational product, which is a mirroring of what is happening in class, only this time it is happening online. This of course has a major success because they, they got funding and they got, they, they've created these major providers, which are these. So this is the map of online education right now with Coursera and EDX and Udacity and the Khan Academy I was talking to you before where these three get the funding from venture capitalists and non-profit uh, organizations which are interested in seeing how this project will develop in the future uh, generations. And these are all providers of XMOOCs, traditional lectures in online formats. Okay? All right. Of course, you can imagine that this involves a lot of people from researchers to universities uh, to students to publishers. There is, a, there is a whole range of people involved in this new experiment. And you can see how involved they are here. So what are the, the, the goals of MOOCs? One was the relief from student loans. I mean, it was financial. But another more philanthropic and uh, motive has been the, the, the possibility to expand to Africa, for example, and, uh, uh, and give education to people who are uh, deprived of this uh, privilege. Hmm? Because all you need is broadcast, nothing, nothing more. All you need is good internet. So they've started uh, creating this because they wanted to extend the reach of the institutions 
They wanted to establish their own brand also. You can imagine that Stanford and Harvard universities wanted to be the first to establish you know, an online presence so they can brand their presence in, on, in, online. And of course, improve the outcomes hmm, of online of education, huh, for, both for online participants and on-campus students. So all this brought a, a, a series of consequences, huh, because all uh, courses needed to be redesigned. You can't just transfer the content online. You have to restructure the content. You have to rethink it. Huh? How can we translate something which is done in class to something which you have no control of once it's online? It's you know up to the people to, to manage it, to handle it. So you have to carefully design everything from the beginning because you have no control over it once you've uploaded it. And of course, another issue with the MOOCs is the pivoting you do from the secondary education to the higher education, and then from there to the professionals. I mean, how can people who are already professionals in the field uh, benefit from this new educational product? Can they specialize? Can they use it to become better professionals in what they're doing? So you see that MOOCs happen in higher education, but there are consequences both for the secondary one and the professionals. And of course, there is a whole range of more goals. I don't want to spend more on that, but I am going to return back to, to talk to you about the difference between the CMOOCs and the XBOOCs, right? So, as I've said, uh, the CIMUCs were created by these two gentlemen who didn't want to have any control over the content. They wanted the students to create their own learning paths. So they've asked them to establish their blogs and they wanted to uh, establish a connection between peers. So uh, students would exchange, huh? uh, they would uh, talk online, they would exchange content online, and they would form their own paths, thinking threads, huh? in this new environment. While well, XMOOCs, as I've said before, is the traditional format of just transfer online. Okay, I want to stop to this because this, the atelier environment of the CMOOCs, was what started, you know, what made us thinking a lot about architecture because architecture is a bit reluctant now. Architectural education is a bit reluctant towards this new means of uh, you know, handling education. So this atelier environment that CMOOCs created for the students that was what made me start you know, thinking what could be done about this. <coughs> so I won't tell you there are lots of types and many types of MOOCs because each uh, institution tried to you know, develop a, something that would suit uh, the, its needs better, okay? So there are spooks, spooks, mooks, dukes, <laughs> many types of mooks. And there are, of course, many providers, commercial ones. There are many online platforms available online that you can borrow hmm, and customize and use for your own class. We've actually used the personal platform, I'll show you. But if you click on that link over there, there are more than a thousand by now. And these platforms provide an environment which is already set with a, a, a ready-made menu you can choose from, uh, educational gadgets, and you can just upload your material in video forms, in transcripts, links to whatever you want, references, software, maybe. Okay. Back to connectivism. What did connectivism say? It said that knowledge is not transferred from educator to learner, but it is distributed across the web. That's what the gentleman over there is saying. And what constitutes learning is not, you know, me talking to you, but you trying to find something online and actually finding it. You learn by trying to find and making connections. 
And this network of connection is, is what constitutes learning, and that's what connectivism provides its students. And according to Rita Kopp, a, a lady who is from Athabasca University, has analyzed this phenomenon quite, quite thoroughly. She said there are four stages in connectivism. The first is aggregation, access to and collection of a wide variety of resources to read, watch, and play. Relation, start connecting this data huh? two to two, you know, one by one, and then reflect and making sense out of this. Huh? By making the connections, by making comparisons, you start huh, creating your own logical and rational threads. And then finally, you share it with the others and you verify, you consult with the others what you found. So if you think about this a bit, doesn't it look similar to the design studio way of doing business? A bit. You start collecting data, mapping, uh, urban mapping, perhaps. And then you start connecting this data. Mm? And then you start making scenarios, mm? prioritizing the data in a certain way by making scenarios to form a solution. And then you present this project, this solution, this proposal, and then you start negotiating uh, with the others and consulting the others about what they think, your structure and your peers. So, this is what I was saying about the network. I tried to find other examples of, you know, uh, online tools in architectural education to see if there were other people out there looking to experiment with what was happening. And what I found was only a few. There is a, an example in uh, Belgrade, Professor Petar Arsic, who's doing this uh, uh, design studio using Moodle. I don't know if you are familiar with Moodle, yeah, if you use Moodle. Mm -hmm. Well, it's rather a repository. It's not actually a tool. It's just a repository where you place things and the students can reach them any time they can. So it wasn't really something. It was you know, just a repository, online repository. And then I found this um, PhD by Susan Lee at the MIT uh, describing uh, 10 cases, 10 examples of MIT trying to establish uh, international relationships with other institutions, architectural schools in particular, and uh, form you know workshops online between different institutions working on a very specific subject, and that happened in 2000. And you know the experiments were a bit outdated because the technology accompanying you know all the uh, communication was a bit far behind, so that didn't do us any better. Any good. So finally, I found, do you know this man, Daniel Libeskind, and the um, online uh, University of Digital Leofana in Germany. They have created their own platform. They didn't use any ready made ones. And through this platform, Daniel Libeskind made a course, did a course, along with Saskia Sassen, I think, and a lot of other respectable scientists all over the world. Uh, about the city of the 21st century, and everybody was invited to join. Students were divided in groups of five, uh, and they uh, were able to, they had access to content, lectures from Daniel Lieberskind and the other professors, and they would then uh, collect this data from the lectures, find their own data, exchange data in between them, and create scenarios for the city of the 21st century. It was called Think Tank. I myself was involved in, a, um, uh, in an online course made by Digital Leofana, which was about commons and the, the possibility to manage commons. Huh? I thought that it was a good idea because, you know, learning is a common, education, knowledge is a common. So I remember this phrase that professors try to encourage the students. Huh? to participate and exchange and interact online. So they said, remember that there is a learning community who's willing to help you and who's counting on those interim submissions 
anxiously waiting to give you feedback on your work. Can you imagine, you know, encouraging the audience to take part mm, and do this connectivist thing, yeah? All right. So, what did we do with this? Let me tell you. So the course <coughs> was this one. It gave methodological tools of analysis for creating strategies for integral urban interventions. The course presented students with multiple ways of mapping the urban phenomena, and they asked students to form scenarios of intervention to a specific area. And it, was, it consisted of a series of mapping tools developed by the latest researchers, the latest research uh, findings of our researchers at the National Technical University of Athens. So it was a, um, there were many people involved in this course, at least six. But the problem was that these people came, they did lectures on their mapping tool, and then they left. And for three hours, students were, um, had to you know, attend to these lectures. They didn't have enough time to get acquainted and accustomed with what was said. And then these people left and never came back, and students were left with a lot of you know, things that were dubiously established in their heads. So what we thought it'd be best, and we started writing down what we wanted, what we really wanted to happen, was to increase this time of interaction. But by having an audience who would be able to discuss and you know, really take part in a conversation about these tools, not just you know, learn about them, but actually get to know them better. So we wanted also to increase interaction between students and instructors. And we wanted to make them accomplices to this process. We wanted them to contribute to the content as much as we did. And because we believe in the theory by design paradigm, we, we thought it'd be best if they applied this knowledge to a specific site. So we would give them the tools, they would reflect upon the tools, they would apply the tools to the specific area given to them, and then they would come back hmm, with questions, real questions, and real uh, you know, issues to resolve in class. And then we would add another phase at the end, a smaller one in duration, where we would evaluate and appraise all these tools given to them throughout the semester. Okay, so this uh, was very similar to the double layer asymmetrical model of education developed by uh, Goldsmith in 1983 in Haifa. She did this at the design studio with no online tools, but she used this model to develop her design studio. And what is important here is that. Okay. There were rationally deductive steps, right? And progress was not intended as linear. Mm -hmm. So students didn't just, you know, step by step learn to do something, but they could go back to what was previously given to them as information and return and do this cyclical act each time they wanted to consult what was previously mentioned and discussed. So it was not about creating a course you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. Instead, we wanted to give the content random stimuli and then ask them to make their own way, create their own way through this. So, of course, the advantage is that students were suddenly encouraged uh, to become more aware of what they were doing, to form their own principles, to establish their own thinking. So this is what we did. These are the students, and that's the teaching team. And we thought that it would be best to meet online and in class. And there were four points of interaction for both environments, OK? On the online environment, we could have an online platform for the lectures, ask students to establish their own blogs, just like in the connectivism paradigm, give them a research project, which, which was done by the National Technical University of Athens. It's a 600-page research 
on the metropolitan center of the city. So it's a, it's a very rich material. And established Google Docs that would be mutually, um, uh, how to say it, shared and um, discuss common. While in class, we could, of course, have live discussions on the lectures previously shown online, illustrate more examples of application of each mapping tool, and then do a workshop. We did one three-day workshop. And of course, show to the students some of the most important blog posts uploaded the previous week. So, the online activities were like this. We had this. Uh, platform. I can show it to you online. If we have uh, internet, I can log in and show it how it works. There was a menu on the left side of the page. Each week we uploaded the material for that week. Okay? One, one mapping tool each week. Uh, first week was about space index, for example. Okay? So we, we uploaded those ten, uh, 10 videos. That was the researcher who did the, her PhD on space index, and she talked about it. Each video uh, didn't last more than seven minutes. It was from two minutes to seven minutes, okay? And its content was designed in a way that, um, you know, it was... Um, to the less? Independent. Independent. The, the meaning in the video was uh, all-inclusive. You could just watch video three and still have uh, a complete content, okay? An integrated content. But all together, all the videos together, seen in even in a random order, it would give you a sense of what space index is all about. Same for the second week. Extended cinema, for example, on the third week. Fourth week was um, an analytical uh, tool about mapping atypical spaces in the city. Uh, uh, local interventions, bottom-up approach. Et cetera, et cetera. And this was the research program I was talking about, the 600 page research. And the student blog posts. 16 of them established their own blogs. There were 17 students in Scribe. There was only one who didn't want to actually create a blog. And from the, uh, from the 17 students, 16 of them did. And two Google Docs. Okay? The two Google Docs were uh, one was a lexicon, and the other one uh, was the course in constitution. The lexicon served because all these mapping tools used terms which were very difficult. And sometimes they were very common words, but used in a very different context. And their definition was a bit complex. And you know, it, it, students needed time to fully grasp its meaning. So we did this, and we didn't just propose the definitions, we actually asked them to intervene. If in, if they didn't like something, if something didn't work out well for them, we asked them to uh, log in and change the definition or propose another. So it was an open Google Doc. It was not definite, it was open for interpretation. And the second was the course constitution. Uh, this was um, taken from another example from a university uh, in the US when we decided to you know, change the rules of the game we wanted students to be equally responsible for those rules. So we asked them to post online and share with us their views on how this exchange would take place. Okay? So, what did the students think about this new arrangement? Well, uh, they, we asked them to evaluate the lectures, the lexicon, all these tools I've mentioned before. And we asked them to give the, the, the uh, time they spent online or uh, evaluate uh, the contribution of the instructors or the students. We did a survey upon the completion of the course. And they were very uh, happy to see the work of others, so they've rated this highly enough. But what's important is that 10 out of 14 people who actually took the survey asked if they could return to the platform the online platform and revisit the, the, the course content even after its completion. So how well did the students do? That was the other question. Now these diagrams, I always put them at my presentations because they were very inspiring when I started this research. It, they were made by the Stanford University for a MOOC 
an ex MOOC that had 150,000 attendees all over the world. So they followed some of these attendees' routes, how they learned, and they've created those diagrams of attendance. So when I saw that at the beginning of my research, I was very inspired. I wanted to do my own diagrams. I wanted to see if learners actually learn in the same way or not. And I was very happy to have created my own this year because it's also what I've shown you, the first, very, uh, the first picture of this presentation. Because each student attended the course in a very different way than the rest. Nobody learns in the same, learn, you know, followed the same course, the same path. And there were just 16 students, 17 students, as I've said. So not just the, 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 during the duration of the course, these are the 10 weeks of the course duration, but also the days of attendance were totally different. No two charts look alike. So you can see number five, how turbulent she was. She, she did that, she kept turning back and fourth, revisiting old videos while, you know, moving ahead. And there were some others who joined us two weeks after the, the, the beginning of the course, or <laughs> that girl who actually yeah, never, never actually submitted anything. And that's what the first image was about. These are their lines of attendance, their charts for the du whole duration of the course, and these are their uh, preferences, the daily preferences for attending. Okay. Did they visit the online units? Yes, they actually doubled the time of attendance. So, uh, with blue you can see their first time of, and uh, you know, the, the first time the videos were uploaded. So, uh, this is week one, there were national holidays and Easter holidays, that's why six weeks lasted ten. You know, the academic semester was prolongated. Anyway, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, 120 clicks on the videos from 17 students. Huh? And then with green, uh, with uh, gray, sorry, light gray, you can see the times they revisited uh, each video. Huh? And these are the Easter holidays, so half clicks were made on the first week before the holidays and the other half just after. And that goes for all six tools. You know, they kept revisiting them. But what's most important here and are their blogs and their blog posts. So we had uh, 146 blog posts, all related to the course content. So we gave them those six mapping tools and they gave us back almost 20. They found material online, videos, theories related to mapping, urban mapping, paradigms, applications, examples. They were so very active online. Some of them were very active. At least seven or eight of them had more than 30 blog posts each. And all related to content, not just, you know, blog posts. And that's what happened with the blogs. So here you have course content week three. And with dark gray, you have all the students hmm, who are active on that week in their blogs and the types of blog posts they made. Okay, this is week six, and this is week nine. With light gray, you'll see all the students who hadn't been active that week. Okay, by week nine, this is different. I mean, Joanna, for example was not active. Where is she? Oh, she's here. But she only posted two times. Okay? You see that each week, different people posted different things. They were not just the same people doing the same thing all over again. The roles were changing. And um, depending on their interests and their own uh, predilections, they chose to interfere, intervene with a blog post or not. And finally, what we did was take this six weeks of course content, and draw the lines of interaction between the student blog posts in regard to what we did, what we gave them as content. So we analyzed the types of blog posts they did, and we connected what they did with what we did. 
and we created this network of, how to say, network of knowledge. So each one of them created, you know, a very different path on this cloud huh, of information and content exchange. And of course, this, uh, these blog posts also influenced their work in their projects because we've asked them to do a three-day workshop and they worked in a specific area. Professor Mother will tell you all about it later. And they um, were very influenced by the blog posts made by their peers. I'm almost over. I don't know if I've passed my time. So these are uh, four samples of student projects examined in regard to their connection to other student blog posts and uh, in regard to their connection to our post content. Hmm? Okay. So there you can see how Anya, for example, that's the, uh, her blogging, she was connected to all these peers uh, through these blogs right here, some of them more, some of them less, and what she did was influenced by these posts. And here you can see that what she's created was influenced by course content five, or week five, week six, and uh, uh, a theory of her own. And here you can also see that all the vocabulary she used to argue her project, to argue her own work, was actually influenced by the lexicon and the terms used by the mapping tools we've shown her. Okay, she incorporated those, this terminology to, her, to argue her own work. And we've done this for Anya and three other students. And you'll see that even Stefanos, who is the student who never established a blog, actually attended other student blogs. And he created his own. So, last but not least, I'm going to, to close the same way I started. That it's not about what we're doing, it's about the subject learner, this new, whole new uh, world of uh, learning in a different way. And it's not just the technology, but the way we interact with each other through technology. So no matter if the lecture is traditional or not, the way the course is conducted, the lesson is conducted, what's important is the curiosity and the personal motive, you know, uh, motivation for, uh, for learning. So here you can see Jacques Rancière, and next to him, one of his best books, in my opinion, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, explaining the experiments of this gentleman here, Joseph Jacotot. This was a French military officer who went to Holland and decided to become an instructor of French, only he didn't know how to speak Dutch. So what he did was borrow a book which was called Telemachus and had both a translation of the French script and the Dutch script. And he gave it to his students and he asked the students to learn by themselves. And they did, because they took the transcripts and they started comparing the two the French verbs and the Dutch verbs, and they started making the connections. And by the end of the year, they could speak French. And he still didn't know how to speak Dutch. So it's not about you know, what the instructor can do for you. It's about what you do for yourself in this learning environment. So it's back to the studiolo type, the person who's willing, who's curious enough to learn. And that's what I think this course has proven that, you know, just like Sir John Gilgood and Peter Greenaway's his Prospero books, what's important here is, you know, that the learner allows himself, herself to learn, uh, is curious enough in this whole new environment. Thank you.
Actually, I'm going to, to be a more visual about the SRN Kanazonga because I'm going to tell you about how we actually ran the course and how the, the students designed the projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, as Ol already said, mapping tools were very important, but they were important on both levels and visual and visual. So it was a combination of the tools that was going to create the project because the, the connection of the visual and variable is the one that creates a concept in architecture. So, uh, well, I did the structure selection in the beginning. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about mapping techniques, techniques in general and then about uh, the concept formation within the visual framework. Uh, the strategies in more detail that were introduced in the course, how uh, and where we do the research and the site, describe the site, and then the project. So starting about mapping. Uh, well, uh, we all know that maps have become more, more complex and they're introduced in a kind of different way because geography has changed and changed with the information and, te uh, and technology and, uh, and internet. And uh, there is a whole area after the 95, uh, after the 90s of uh, mapping in a different way, in a more complex way. So in um, general in architecture school, we started to introduce some years ago the mapping as a kind of very important thing, not and, uh, and introducing it as a subjective thing, not an objective thing, and then uh, and not uh, as an impersonal kind of interpreting the city. So, um, so we always introduce this in, uh, in the student project, and we think that introducing uh, a mapping is a kind of more inspirational tool. It helps them to design and to recognize qualities and relevant issues that are very interesting. So in that sense, a mapping can be any time, any type of formation. Uh, it can be skating balls, mapping the skating balls on, on a plan. So it has, it has become, it can broaden, you know, the issue of mapping. So, uh, of course, the first one that started the mapping in the studio project was Bernard Jumet in the 90s in, uh, in the AA School of Architecture when he did the transcript, Manhattan transcripts, and where, where he started recording the city in three different ways, uh, event, space, uh, space recording in the planning section, event is a photograph, and he used uh, uh, two cinematic uh, cinematic concepts to present the city. So he was the, the first advocate. Here are some extracts for, from the um, transcripts, yes, where he's using to, he, he starts reading the city context in a different way, placing the event as a very important issue in the, in the way we map the city. It's not just about making a plan, it's about how people live in it and how we record it. And uh, here, um, again, the recording of a murder and within the transcripts. I mean, you know, I know mean, you know the transcripts, very important. Yes, and recording the events. And then in the, in the middle of the 90s, I happened to be in London and I did my PhD there and I was teaching there. And I was there uh, within the transition of how uh, internet and design tools became digital. And it was during the 90s when I started, in the beginning of the 90s, I started teaching and they still, they were holding pens, the students, in their hands. And by the middle of the 90s, there was only computer. So the transition was very, very quick. And what happened, and the mapping concept start appearing in the middle of the 90s for the first time as a concept in, in England. In what I say in the Anglo-Saxon education, because Anglo-Saxon education is different from our education. It's a completely different world. And because I, I come from Greece and I didn't know Anglo-Saxon education, I learned it during my PhD there, I realized it's completely different, yes? So mapping was introduced uh, in the studios in a very kind of explorative way and it was um, uh, it was used, the, the internet helped a lot, and digital representation had helped a lot to reform the way that uh, we're mapping objects and the cities. And this is a very interesting, um, in 2010, um, a prize, a golden prize, an IBA golden prize, a student prize, 
who is uh, stating very explicitly that uh, mapping is subjective and we're interested in the subjective reading of the city and how the, we are, we are interpreted in it and the fragments that we are interested in and not the reading of the city as whole, which is actually what happened the last year with the Anglo-Saxon education. But generally, mapping has become much more re richer using a lot of techniques in the way that these are represented. Artists start recording the city of Berlin, yes, with founding object, founded object. And of course, he devolved a very important uh, person talking about psycho uh, uh, psychogeography and how mapping of Paris becomes psychological and very personal game with the way you recorded it. Again, personal recordings with sketches and found objects. The recording of the census done by Ohio University where they're trying to record smell and texture and sound. Um, and the, and the recording, and this is a very interesting project that happened in Palestine, in Palestine where in a camp, uh, they were trying to record the way the children were playing, using small pockets of spaces, and making a game out of everything. So this is actually the play pockets that were recorded as a kind of mapping within the campus. So in that sense, we always, and this is the pattern of New York, it's the photographs of tourists and inhabitants. So some parts of this were blocked from our students, yes. But always, uh, when you start an urban project, we always make some lectures of this context and we always try to make them think in a more broad way of what they see in the city and how they're recording it. So this comes, well, my PhD was about studio teaching when I did it in, in Bartlett. I did my PhD in Bartlett. And it was about the concept of formation and how it happens with the interaction between the visual and the verbal level. And uh, like uh, Olga said about the cyclical way of the development of the knowledge, it comes out of the theory of Vygotsky. I don't know if you go Vygotsky, it's a, a Russian pedagogist. Very important, as Piazet, but he was kind of unknown for a, a time. And Piazet was getting more known. But he was about, he was talking about this, about the cyclical development of knowledge about how we go back and forth to form our knowledge, and how, uh, first of all, we see and then we conceive. And it comes with unheim visual thinking, you know the book. So all of these books come together to form an argument that says that visual is very important when we design, and on any level of design, if it's urban or a house or a something or anything, the visual becomes a very, a very um, key, place in the, in the role of design. So, um, so what we tried to do, along with the theory that Tolka was describing, well, all the tools we given them were some fragments of visuality, some visual elements, with which, although maybe they were algorithms, algorithms or they were diagrams, digital diagrams, they all had a quality that was reflecting something of a space, yes? So we, we're in between this uh, edge point where they could be read like space or they could be read like diagrams, which actually is where always Anglo-Saxon world was at. Because Anglo-Saxon world was always translating things into space in a kind of arbitrary way. Uh, well, design has an arbitrary element to it, but we try to be analytical and arbitrary at the same time. Uh, so, this is very interesting because it's a, a kind of uh, intellectual stimuli because it's a work of uh, Ricardo Basbaum, um, an artist who uh, decided to share the artistic experience all over the world. So he sent his basins, you see there, everywhere and asked the people to use them the way they could. So he got back and his folks, you can imagine, they were uh, swimming with them, they were playing clothes, they were cleaning clothes with them. And then our student took this paradigm, and because working under a bridge, and I'm going to show it later, took the shape of the bridge and formed an object, which in theory, he would 
sent to the inhabitants of the, of the area, which is a kind of uh, straight analog between the two, you know, of how he used this example to create Harris. So, so we, we decided to give them a big dose. This, actually, these images are from our 800 page uh, research program, what you see about the area of uh, Evander. And uh, the tools were from our students, our PhD students, they're presented in five lectures, and they were starting from very analytical ones to, to, to experiential ones. So we gave them a range of very different uh, tools. The first one, Space Index, you know it, from Bill Hillier in the, in the UCL. Well, is a very, very famous tool where you record uh, the city and the space using axial maps, uh, axial maps, axial lines. And these axial lines uh, relate to connectivity and depth of analysis in relation to how one axis meets the other one. And when one axis meet, has a lot of connections, then it's more dense in the way that this uh, is, um, in the way it has a presence in the urban fabric. So you can see when you analyze with axial map an urban fabric, you, you could see straight that the red lines are the more dense one. And then as you go up, out to the blue ones, there's the less used ones. So you can have a map with actually the way that these uh, axis, axis, street axes are used for in relation to density. And in India, they're using it a lot uh, to analyze uh, urban vision. And then another one that comes from uh, uh, using um, the, the concept of cluster and connectivity and graphs. And it's a lot about um, creating uh, clusters of similarities and atypical formations. And all these are the internal, internal yards of our blocks, of our urban blocks. And the color C, the quality and the, the connectivity between them. It's another analytical tool uh, that we used in our research with the area, both of them. And then a more kind of open tool where it, um, it stems from the belief that every one of us records the uh, city in a different way. Uh, or photographic, or sound, or we look at the city through Google. So uh, it talks about the subjectivity of reading and how we can uh, read the city from below. I mean, working on it from above, from a Google map, Outside, we'll look at it from the cinema, or inside when we're walking in. So it created four different categories of recording the city, and uh, she is trying currently to combine and to make some, uh, uh, to create a system of analysis for this type of uh, reading. And then uh, the, the change of view with the cinema and mainly with television. And, uh, and the evolution of uh, viewing uh, to the use of expanded cinema and virtual world. This is another PhD where it, go, it talks about, and this is the example that I show you about more socially engaged art and how socially engaged art makes us, makes us look at the city in a very different way. So I'll put you, we'll come back to this when we look at the students' projects, but now I'll show you a bit of the research we've done. The Polytechnic in the National School of Athens. So, this is uh, Athens, extended Athens, and this is uh, Mythos, Mythos Mountain, yes, Acropolis, the Cabetus, and it goes up to the Gallio Mountain. So, there is uh, the concept is to create a green foot yeah, that would uh, take on board the Saliani and the Gallio uh, and the and, uh, Licabetus and Acropolis and go to our Yera or those where we say it's Cayer uh, Sacra. Cayer Sacra. The Cayer Sacra we have. Yera or those is the root Sacred, uh, that was starting yeah. from Athens and went to Alexis. Do you know to remember Alexis in the ancient world? Elsina. You know, it was the root that was connecting uh, Athens with Elsina. Elsina where, where the mysteries were taking place then in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. How do you? The Lefsinian mystery. Do you know the Lefsinian mystery? 
is outside. There was a celebration, a myst uh, mystic celebration in ancient Athens. Mm -hmm. And there was this route that united Alexina with this, the cemetery Athens. of Keramikos in Athens. Athens. Yeah. still. Uh, uh, on, on top of the road is uh, this road with which we worked mm -hmm. in the research program and with the students. So, uh, well, Athens is suffering a lot from the lack of green. So the whole thing was done to try to create this green route and, and connect the antiquities of Athens you know, and the, the two mountains. Um, and this is actually a very, very important area of Athens, which is completely derelict at the moment. Just next to the center, it's called Eleonas, like olive tree forest. It was our olive tree from ancient times. So uh, we have a very old map here, Cowper map, that shows the extent, the extension of this olive uh, yard, olive yard, let's say, it's forest, yeah, it's a very extensive area. Uh, within which there uh, it used to be a lot of rivers, yes, from the mountains. So it always had a lot of water. And here is the underwater level today. Because what happens? Because they forgot the land, they forgot the olive trees and everything. And a lot of uh, um, industry were placed there. So there are a lot of, uh, sometimes with the rain, they the flooded, the flooded, the, the lowest flood. And here is, um, make it stand, here is the road we're talking about. Here is Keramikos, which is a cemetery. Here is Omonia Square. It's very, very near Omonia Square. You can walk to this area, 20 minutes walk, but it's forgotten. It's not used. It's like all the, uh, the, the university of uh, cultivation uh, is there, which is placed somewhere here, and all the rest is just uh, industry abandoned land. Yeah? So uh, our project related to this cross and this cross, and this is the main road entering to the city from the north, from South Africa. The national so road. It's a national mm -hmm. road. So we have a big crossing here. And from this side is a derelict area of uh, Eleonas, of this uh, uh, olive tree thing. And on this side is a valley which is a suburb, not a suburb, a suburb, a suburb. Yes. Very good. So this this one splits the city in two. You have to go see. Yeah, yeah. This is actually this ancient road we're talking about. Uh, they excavated parts of this, so you can find along the route some excavations that uh, goes to the back to the ancient times. Yes. But mostly, here is an urban, um, a valley is an urban neighborhood. Here is the ceramic coach, which is the, the area near Ammonia Square, in the center. And in between Mafia, you see, this is spares, or big buildings, uh, abandoned buildings, industry, and uh, very big, uh, uh, um, how say, uh, shelters, and, all these are industry or abandoned things, yes? And the very, the very curious thing is that because there is no route that goes straight, you cannot see what's happening left and right because you walk on the street and you cannot view very far, you cannot view deep because the, the streets are very shortened. You know, actual streets don't exist on the right and the left of, the, of this area. As a result, a lot of, um, uh, how do you say, Dodgy activities take place. Illegal. Illegal. Yeah. Illegal. So there is uh, left and right crime. illegal activities, yeah. crime, and uh, recycle of materials that uh, they are stolen, scrap. scrap materials that they steal, all of these things. It's a very interesting area, in fact, for research. I mean. And then we come to our, our issue here. This is our national road. This is our sacred road. This is a bridge here. Well, from here we have uh, the housing and the area of Rallo, and you have the, or what I described is the kind of program on this side. So the students have to deal with this problem. Because we understand under the bridge, we have a lot of friends again, it's no man's land. It's in between this, the inhabitants of Rallo, and between here. So 
We gave them that as a, as a project. Here's a bridge. And not in the habitat bridge. There, and this is a good bridge photographs. You see the scale of this and the scale of this. So, uh, the student project, well, they tried to start and applying different um, methodologies taken from what uh, we gave them as lectures to, uh, to form kind of uh, proposal for what's happening under the bridge. We, unfortunately, uh, not all the students arrived to the same level of final projects. You know, some of them uh, were stopped just before any final resolution. So I show you this in relation to how the student used the idea of uh, sending objects, this kind of object that was created, an abstract model from the bridge, to different parts of an island city, yes, and different parts of industry, and uh, expected the results of how they would use this. This is a map of uh, the, the objects, the, the generic object. And now, uh, right there, uh, in orange, we, we just written what are the inferences from the lectures for the project. So this project is very similar. Uh, the atypical special convention, there's a lot of computer programs. So the students use a lot of computer programs. And the function mapping, that means our research. So here we have, again, uh, a very analytical approach. So it reads uh, the, the place. Uh, is, uh, she is very interested about um, environment, the student, and about how, how she's going to use environmental issues again in a place where it was kind of green. And um, so she started investigating uh, the underwater currents and everything, the all green, and how she can reuse them. This is actually map. Uh, we do have the space syntax. This is other way of recording. What is called density and non density for different kind of. Kind of uh, um, and this is under current rivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For all these, she, she, she used GPS and all kind of computer programs to get there. And the greens. And the, these are all actually the undercurrent water of the area. But at the moment, it's buried. There is a, a very old uh, undercurrent small river that is full of garbage at the moment. So actually, nothing has happened in this area in relation to that. But the students start using this as we did with the program and researching for, for possible green spaces of the area. This is what we did in the program as well. So this is a recording of the possible green spaces of the area in relation to undercurrent water. Again. So, and then we start talking about sun and how sun is working in this urban fabric and which of these areas getting the sun. So with the combination of sun and water, they're going to, be, they're going to have the possibility of becoming the greenest. So this is the sun path in this area. So the, the map of the sun path. Again, implemented on the side, yes, of how we're going to use the, um, actually the, the crossing, yeah. yeah. And he's creating a big garden, this is her proposal, under the crossing. She has a lot to argue with. She creates these kind of images. Actually, she brings the green land again within the, within the crossing. And we have another one, the Postulus, who decided that uh, he wants to tackle the issue of non visuality on the left of the right of this axis. So she, he tried to bring images from inside, from what's happening inside the black area, you know, the no man's land, to bring it to the axis of the street. So 
So she, he's trying to create some post where he's going to project all the activities that are happening behind the street that we cannot see. So <coughs> he, to do that, he used the uh, space syntax and the algorithm and the algorithms. And now we have <coughs> another student. As you see, each student has gone his own path, has posed his own questions of what he wants to do there again, yeah? different, different questions, and uh, use different uh, strategies, inspired from what we've given them, to create their own strategy. So they combine different strategies. And now we have space syntax and a new tool that this student create, creates, and it's about, um, how do you call it? Conductor theory. Conductor theory, yes. So he, she decided that there are areas that are very dense in relation to um, habitation, in relation to activities, and some areas that are not dense. So she decided to, for example, the green areas are the dense areas, activity dense areas, and the black ones are the non dense, dense activities. And she decided to do some connection so she can liven, she can be, uh, become the dome the kind of more, less habitated area becomes more dense. So um, she, she goes into finding a dense area here and a dense area here. Of course, the dense area here is kind of a cause with all the kind of uh, night activity. It's a very night activity. And this is a kind of, uh, a kind of ordinary urban uh, part of the city. And in between is the nomad's land. So if he's, he's trying to create some kind of uh, dense places and interconnectivity between them, so the in-between can become active. And then she tried to implement that in Athens, creating a relationship between the Capetus and the, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So uh, here, <laughs> we have a very conceptual approach. This student is uh, recording one side of the bridge, like sitting under the bridge and making sketches of the side that is the urban side, and then goes on the other on the other side and creates sketches of the normal side. And then he is kind of, his suggestion is to flip these images and to make the inhabitants do the same so they get involved with the issue of how we have a completely different sites and how we realize we have that because most people don't realize it because across the crossing they don't, they don't want it, yes? To make it uh, obvious that there is a problem so he can give initiative to the inhabitants to do something about it. So it's about more about a programmatic approach. He's not proposing something more specific than sketching. And, uh, so he's doing the projections within this type of projections under the, the bridge. And then we have uh, this kind of algorithmic or uh, he's using death map and grasshopper and isobist. So how the viewing points from the bridge outside and from outside to the bridge and create this kind of diagrammatic plans. You can see this one I showed in the beginning. Uh, trying to create visual context <coughs> from points within this side and this side of uh, the area, trying through this uh, viewing points to create a kind of connective, to connect the two areas together. Okay, so he's uh, recording the human activity. And photographs from Instagram, Flickr, and uh, Panoramio. Mm -hmm. and he categorized the photographs he retrieved in three major categories, inside and outside, uh, light, uh, night and day, and uh, private or uh, collective activities. So he mapped uh, the photographs, he, he placed the photographs depending on, on these three categories on the map. 
and he retrieved evidence that uh, there is more, uh, there are more activities during the night, for example, that's why there are more pictures, so he did a programmatic proposal saying that if that's what's happening now, if you want to change it, you might want to go this way, or this is what's happening there, and if you want to change it, you might want to go this way. It was more programmatic, an analysis through images. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of, I this axis that are more kind of uh, used uh, from uh, people and he's trying to, he, he reports that actually mm -hmm. and he's proposing that this needs to stop and the two parties should come together and then we have a, a final proposal, it's kind of interesting because the student created a game mm -hmm. um, about it, yeah. Yeah? This is a game, a uh, kind of platform for the children created for the inhabitants of the area for the next hundred years. Yes. <laughs> to the people of Eleonas in the Rado. So this is a map of the area. And then see, you log in or you sign in to the game. And then you to, he created, okay. she created four categories, which is politics, social, economics and civilization and then you choose the category and you go in so it's a very interactive platform for the inhabitants of the area so they interact with it so when you, you go into politics there is a law and there are the strategic uh, Intervention. interventions so you can go into the law and learn about what's happening uh, within the area so to different uh, law subjects then you go to the society and then you have um, uh, you have all the uh, social activities, social activities, collectivities, uh, collectivities etc. All the all for the inhabitants. You have the bibliography about the area, and you have uh, what's happening outside the law, whatever uh, financial activities outside the law, legal. Yes, so there is a call of legal activities. Of course, that this can, cannot happen, but anyway. <laughs> really difficult. And then it goes to, into finances and into uh, programs, financial programs for the area and enterprises. Enterprises and then the civilization where there's all the uh, online games uh, and uh, kind of uh, theater and dance etc. Uh, in relation to information. So actually it's a platform for, for for the town city, yes, where they can use and the inhabitants can play and they can interact, interact. And in fact, we have talked about a platform like that with the mayor of Rayo, uh, who we know well, and he's very interested in creating a platform for the inhabitants because that's where they can get into the internet phase, and this can happen a lot, into acquiring information and um, and actually kind of taking part of the way that the whole set, uh, the whole uh, activity is set. So uh, that's all about it. Have you had any meetings with the students, with the students? And we, have, we have a meeting with Olga and the mayor, and we are in the process of all the students as well, into uh, starting a new research program for the area, mm -hmm. because the first packet was general, but this time, uh, the mayor changed and the new mayor is interested in implementing a more kind of digital city, you know, to make a digital part of the city so it can become a more uh, networked uh, as an area. So the inhabitants can get in and they can get, they can find the movable uh, doctors and they can do, you know, they can organize themselves more in the internet based. Yeah, he's interested. And next year, the, the class will co cooperate with the mayor and the, the people from the mayor's office, and we can have a more um, integral view on the matters that the issues that are raised during their administration, and make the students aware of what is happening. It is actually it is it is because in the beginning we did this was not the big research program was about 
uh, everything. It was not only about this part of the city, but it related to three other parts as well. But now I have focused on this part because this part is more underdeveloped and it's very near Monia Square, it's very near the center. So that's why it's very interesting because mm -hmm. it's underdeveloped. And uh, the, the happy coincidence is that the, the mayor of part of it is interested in doing things. So it is an opportunity. So that's why we decided we stay in the same area. We're not going to change the area. Mm -hmm. We kind of deepen the proposals because at the moment the proposals are kind of uh, Yes, they are in the first approach. Actually, we didn't go deep enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they can offer really things and opportunities to the mayor and to the citizens of this part of Athens. It's a very interesting. We will increase the number of workshops. We will give them more opportunities for design. This year we were very reluctant because we only had a few time at our disposal and we didn't know how it would work for the students if they would, you know, uh, absorb the thing and be online platform and be you know equally active in class. We, we didn't know all these things. Now that we know, we'll increase the number of workshops. We'll give them more opportunities for design and composition. But you are working in the fourth or fifth year. No, this, of is the, this is master. This is master level. But at this level, it's the same as our fifth year level. Uh, yes. In the fifth yes. year in the masters, we do urban projects. Mm -hmm. In the lower classes, master level. this is master level, but uh, the fifth year level can be quite similar to this. In the fifth year we do urban uh, project and we, uh, we have actually a very strong trend in our school with urban tutorials. We have throughout the third, fourth, fifth year they do urbanism as a class. So they do three years of urbanism and then in the final year with urban design tutors in combination, so design tutors and urban design tutors, we run a semester of urban studies, design, urban design. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I said we went to Cyprus, and last year we went to a different area of Athens. Yeah, so this, on the size of the courses in, in time or in European credits, uh, because the size. Ah, of the, the size of the course in European five, credits is uh, the same. Six years. Uh, or six or eight, maybe one ten. Semester. One semester. Yeah. One semester, mm -hmm. yes. It's one semester. And yes. this is a mandatory yes. 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 option. No, 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 no. It's a mandatory. Mm -hmm. It's mandatory. Because we have in the school a, a strong trend of urbanism and of urban design, parallel to the design. So we want our students to learn to, to draw landscape. We do a lot of landscape design as well to do urban projects uh, connecting landscape design and urban design together, yes? Mm -hmm. So we have one unit with landscape design and the final unit with urban and landscape design, which is this, uh, not this, but in the proper course we have one. Mm -hmm. And then this is on the master course, the mapping thing. So we do it. And the beginning of the first year is about more about design, proper design, like school and house and uh, a public uh, building, you know, kind of these type of things. But when they go into the fifth level, they do urban. And uh, in their diploma project, because we are free, they choose whatever they want. We have a, a big percentage of landscape and urban design. We get students that are very interested on that issue. And we have, of course, simple projects. It depends what they choose the subject and the project and the professor. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, I think here you don't have a free choice, do you? Yes, the diploma, you do? In the, in the okay. diploma, you mean in the bachelor? Project, yes. yes. Not in the bachelor, the diploma, the final year. Ah, in the final year. Yeah. Yes, we have some optional. Ah, you do? Yes. Okay. We have a first semester mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some subjects. Some of them are optional. And the second semester is only for working on the diploma, on the, on the final project. But this is uh, this was uh, master's level, and all the urban thing is master. No, it's uh, uh, we don't have master level. We don't have bachelor and master. We haven't split the school according to the ETS yet. We keep it as a five-year course. I haven't done the split. Have you done it? You give a bachelor degree and a master yeah. degree. You do. Yeah. Well, we kind of refuse. <laughs> you refuse. Yes, for some refuse. reason, yes. Mm -hmm. We do refuse, so we don't have the split. We, we go into diploma, so we have straight five years. 
We don't break it into. There are no yet, sort of yet. three year cycle but or two year cycle. You told me yesterday that you have five years and mm. then master's. Yes. yes, yes. And you get the diploma only after the five years. years. Five years. Yes. The five, five years. years. Yes. And then they like need to do the diploma yes. in order to become architects. For us, it's the same. Mm. Oh, okay. Yes, and we then have, we have a master's. five year oh, yes. uh, yes. degree yes. and, and then, then yeah. one year master's. Just like yes. Once when you uh, officially have this. <laughs> Mm. Officially, you have that. Our our students finish at six or seven years. Yes. They okay. never finish in five yeah. years. Yeah. So they the the kind of very quick finish at six years, the very slow at seven years. Mm -hmm. So nobody finishes in five years. Yeah. Yeah. So usually they arrive five years and then they start the diploma project mm -hmm. and it starts and it finishes in one or two years. It takes yeah. a long time, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the master course is one year, but it usually take them two years. Mm -hmm. So in relation to how the, the studies last, it's very, very similar to Spain. They mm -hmm. last a long time. Yes, I think. They last a long time. Yeah. Because we have a lot of electives, mm -hmm. a lot. A lot of theory, a lot of urbanism, a lot of proper studio, a lot of theory, whatever. We have a big program, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it takes them long to mm -hmm. to manage to do it properly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, you know, we work like crazy, we run like crazy. We don't have we don't have time to breathe because we don't have, don't have a lot of administration staff support us. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of administration ourselves, and we're a school of 1,000 students. So 1,000. So every year has um, uh, 150 students to 200, and this is split in the, in the five six units. So every tutor like me and Olga, we share. This year it's better, but usually we share. 20 groups of students, of two, uh, like 50, 60 students, because we can't teach them individually. We make them work in groups. So not in the beginning, but in the final years, we teach group students. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you teach them individually. Yeah, two or three. Mm -hmm. They're not individual works anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of advise them yes, to work in a team, so we can teach them better. Because so we have enough time to 